So without any further ado, um, I hand over to Simon, and thank you for agreeing to give the talk today, Simon. OK. Thanks very much, everybody, for coming. OK, so I'm going to introduce you to learning analytics and, um, and suggest that, uh, in fact, the kinds of technologies that you're building here may well have a serious contribution to make to the way in which we use data to advance education and learning. Uh, that might be in formal contexts, like in a university or in a school, or it might be in informal contexts, the way people are learning a lot online these days, or in the workplace, in professional development, ongoing communities of practice, that kind of thing. And the subtitle is The New Burden of Knowledge, and I hope what will become clear is that uh, the more we know, the more we have a responsibility to do something with it, perhaps. Uh, and that throws up interesting ethical issues. And this is just a version of the big ethical debates around big data and analytics that impact society. When we're talking about real human beings um, who have a view about how they're being studied and tracked, that's rather different than big data studying uh, you know, theoretical physics at CERN or the, the human genome. They don't have a view about how they're being studied. Those, those particles and, and, and genes, etc. human beings do. And that's important. So um, we will have succeeded today if you walk out the door with better questions than you can bring right now. And uh, with perhaps ideas about technology and collaboration opportunities that might be coming your way if you decide that you want to try and advance education, as opposed to many of the other important you know, sectors in society which could benefit from data. So why are we seeing the following kinds of things? We have companies like Desire to Learn partnering up with IBM, who bring big enterprise data analytics capability. We have Blackboard partnering up with iStrategy, who do enterprise data analytics. Right. We have publishers like Pearson partnering up with Newton, so they can offer personalized, adaptive, customized learning experiences. And we then McGraw-Hill by Alex, another adaptive learning company. We are seeing that ed tech startups are very, very hot in Silicon Valley right now. <laughs> Education has suddenly become a very cool area for technology intensive organizations to start thinking about. And then we have the, the rise of the MOOCs, the massive open online courses offering high quality content for free with a cohort of students to go through with assessment built in. And if you pay uh, with verification of your identity and certification of your accomplishments. So when MIT and Harvard launch edX, they're not doing it just to give free high quality content to the world uh, or to be a shop window for uh, the world to think about whether they could um, come and study there. There's a basic research opportunity here. This is big data giving us the chance to ask big questions about learning. Coursera, the spin out from Stanford, hiring many people to do analytics work. Your own Trinity College Dublin, the first Irish university to, to sign up with FutureLearn, which was the UK company spun out from the OU, where I am, to host free online learning from lots of different universities, primarily UK, but now out to Australia, as well as Trinity. And I work on the analytics offering that FutureLearn will be providing at futurelearn.com. So the big message is that the, the, the data analytics tsunami that has been hitting many other sectors is about to hit education. If you're familiar with the Strata conference from the O'Reilly Group, right? it's all about how business is changing, public services and government as well. And so you might say, well, is there any chance that higher education would be immune from this, apart from just being slow and conservative and stuck in its ways? Are there good reasons why this, this revolution shouldn't hit education? And you know, the universities uh, across the world and indeed, why wouldn't a sector which is apparently supposed to be f interested in evidence-based thinking and, and uh, evidence-based action 
w why would we not welcome um, a huge amount of data about what our students are doing and, 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 and how, they're, how they're working? Well, as you'll see later on, there are legitimate concerns, um, but uh, we'll get to that in due course. So, learning analytics is one of the sort of hot new terms right now. Um, in 2011, the annual horizon report gave it a four to five year adoption horizon. Um, in 2013, um, that was two to three years. So we're sort of, you know, the pace is picking up slightly. Um, everybody's talking about learning analytics in the world of education and technology. Um, there's just continuous coverage of it. I just picked this up yesterday, an alert, an article, you know, what's so big about big data and education. But equally, there are ethical issues about the power of algorithms to make decisions, the power of algorithms to filter students out from course applications, the power of algorithms to decide what you should see next on your screen, perhaps. Right? That's what predictive modeling is doing in many other sectors, trying to build a profile of the learner and give, a, give, give the organization an insight into whether um, they're a good person to give car insurance to, medical cover, many other kinds of areas. All right. So lots of interesting debates going on here. And um, arguably, there's a, a perfect storm brewing. A perfect storm is the coming together of several different variables. And when you mix them, you create a highly aggravating situation. All right. Of course, what's highly aggravating for one person might be a huge opportunity for another. And so in the world of education, it's being broken open by the, th there's the three C's, content, community, and certification. Universities used to have the stranglehold and the monopoly on those things. If you wanted to evidence higher degree level learning, you had to go to a university or a college, right? Now we have open content. You don't have to go to a university to find smart people who want to learn about the same stuff as you and to think, start to learn to think like a, an, an educated academic person. Certification is possibly the last stranglehold. Right? Once a university degree, which is already being devalued, there's no way it guarantees you a job these days, once that is up against other forms of evidence of learning that help you get your job, universities are going to be having to worry a lot. And then meantime, we have a whole swirl of other stuff going on. And certainly in the UK, you know, the, the university fees have jumped massively. And people are asking again the question, well, what's the added value for, for me to come to university rather than, say, go get a job and learn part time while I'm earning? And so for some people, the whole higher education learning landscape is changing. Um, big tectonic shifts, people are, are arguing. It's hard to tell how, how much that is um, hype. But certainly things are changing, and all university leaders um, are thinking hard about this kind of thing. So we have a perfect storm. Um, we're already seeing the thunder and lightning from that. We have potentially the reshaping of the landscape. Perhaps the only thing that's missing from this picture are some slow-moving dinosaurs and some very fast-moving predators. And I wonder where they might be. So. As I said earlier, this potentially is a huge opportunity for learning, educational research, the learning sciences. Um, um, and let me just show you um, an extract from a product review of an analytics um, piece of software. And the reviewer wrote, some have tried to argue that this technology doesn't work out cost effectively when compared to conventional testing. But this misses a huge point. More often than not, we test after the event and discover the problem, but it's too late. And we are, of course, talking about aquarium analytics. This is just one of the new areas to be impacted by software which monitors the ecosystem and alerts you when the conditions are starting to go wrong. And you have your own analytics dashboard. This is my next door neighbor, Mark, who happens to be a very good fish person. Um, but he couldn't get his analytics software running. So I, he banged on the door, and I went around. And we spent about two hours trying to get this dashboard to work. It was the first to market product, a bit ropey. 
but then finally the dashboard springs to life. It calibrates the aquarium, it knows what kind of fish you're using, it, it, it knows what kind of plants you've got in there, it knows about the light levels, and once it's calibrated itself, it starts to tell you, are you outside the limits of healthy nitrogen, pH, ammonia, lighting levels, temperature. And so the review goes on. Well, this means that the keeper can be notified before water conditions directly harm the fish. An assured outcome of predictive software that lets you know if it looks like the pH is due to drop or the temperature's on its way up. This way, it's a real fish saver as opposed to a forensic examiner post-wipeout. Right? And if one of those aquariums dies, you, you're losing hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Right? These fish are expensive. The whole thing is a very expensive hobby. You don't want it to crash. Of course, we could change a few words there. And we could be wondering whether we could have an environment that could be a real student saver rather than a forensic examiner post-wipeout. Now, what would it take to build an, an environment like that that nurtured an ecosystem of learners? Well, on the left here is the iPhone app for that product, you know, and it's giving me a heads up on the key variables, right? How, how, do, how, how can they do that? Because there is something called aquarium science which understands if you want to maintain the life of your fish, you need to pay attention to these variables and they have certain limits on them, right? There's a scientific underpinning to that. Can we do that for learning? You know, this is the big challenge for learning sciences for education. Education up till now has been very much a craft practice and it could be that what we're about to see is the shift of education into a data-driven science, just like we've seen in other disciplines. Um, new ways of doing investigation, and new ways of testing hypotheses. You know, if you think you understand learning, tell me what the key variables are. Let's monitor those. Tell me when you think it's going to crash. Let's see if it happens. Let's see if we can predict which learners are going to fail before they die, and we're just clearing up the mess. Well, it's starting to happen, right? Purdue University, one of the leaders in the field of predictive analytics, right? There's the iPhone app showing the red, amber, green on certain variables. They were able to successfully predict an impressively high number of students who would need help. <clears throat> and they have identified the key variables that they needed to pay attention to in order to predict the students who are going to struggle. Right. CMS is the, that's the content management system, right? So what are they doing on, on their VLE, their Blackboard system or whatever it is they use, right? Particular variables plus a bit of demographics on, on well, not demographics, but pre, their previous scores they came into the study, right? When you pay attention to those variables, you know, they did many, many tests. You can predict which students are likely to, to need help. So that's pretty interesting. In fact, <coughs> Even when what they called course signals, which is American for traffic lights, right? You log into your, to your blackboard and you get a red, amber, green that tells you, the student, are you on course? Right? Even when you were on a course that wasn't running that experimental software at the time, you still had higher grades and were better organized to seek out help for yourself than you were compared to students who'd never seen signals. In other words, this feedback loop was in actually building better study skills and making you more aware of what to do when you were struggling. Okay? So that's interesting as well. It's creating metacognitive ability. So at the Open University, we are looking at you know, all the different data sets that we might have. And like most universities, these are all, most of these are siloed off in different places. Right? It's the same old story for big data and analytics. Somehow you have to bring this stuff together and then we can start to ask questions about predicting the likelihood of dropout or formal withdrawal or, or complete failure. Uh, or, and we're exploring a whole range of different things from conventional statistics to machine learning and, and the new kinds of data sets that are coming on stream. And you know, there's work we're beginning to publish now from my group. This is work by Zdenek Straal. Some of you may know him. Um, taking demographic data, taking previous accomplishment results, but adding in virtual learning environment. What are they doing on Moodle? 
as, as they are studying. And when you add in the VLE data, the click level data, you get much more precise results in terms of predicting um, the struggling students. Okay, so interestingly, those examples don't really have much theory in them at all, right? That's just taking some behavioral book variables and some background data about the student, doing some machine learning and predictive modeling and trying to find a good fit for what actually happened, right? So that's really taking the university's collective intelligence. We know this about our students. We know that students of this sort seem to struggle. Trying to do some machine learning, actually there was very little theory at all, which is kind of interesting for educational researchers, right? Without knowing any educational theory, I can predict which students are going to struggle better than you, possibly. That's a bit worrying. However, what if we were to actually bring in theory as well? Top down, as well as bottom up behavioral. Very interesting. Okay. So when we, I've sort of talked in general about analytics, let's get a bit more specific about what we're talking about here. Okay. There are, when people say analytics, they, they may mean many different things. Right? We could think of it at a macro level, which is data you know, at regional level upwards. That might be things like the league tables. I don't know if you have them in, in, in Ireland, but certainly in Britain, people obsess about school league tables. Certainly universities obsess about where do they get put in the, in the, in the, the, the global league tables. And that's using, uh, and, and that's using very high level data. It's like graduate, graduate le levels, exam results. Um, uh, and then there are data interoperability initiatives that are trying to join up some of those high level data sets. Okay. Like a government department might want to have a dashboard that shows all, all schools or all universities in the country or something like that. But they're looking at very coarse grained data. It's usually about success rates and that kind of thing, dropout rates. Then we have what we, call, we might call MISA, which is at the level of the institution. And this is kind of business intelligence products that we know and love already from the world of business and commerce, right? Help the organization run better, study the processes that are going on, and, and, and so forth. But simply bringing a business intelligence product like SAS or IBM's Cognos Suite or whoever it is into a university, that may add value to the extent that a university is like any other, un any other big institution that needs to manage its processes better. Right? But it's not really learning analytics. There's nothing new there, really. What's new is the fine-grained process data at the micro level, if we're going to use the macro, meso, micro levels, right? And that's where the data explosion is really going to happen. Right? And then, once you've got these layers going, as we can then aggregate user traces, which will then enrich you know, the meso and macro level, suddenly at, at the state level, you might be aggregating data from this level. And similarly, once you, can, once you can aggregate data sets from many, many different schools or universities, you can test models and assumptions and see whether they generalize across, you know, and, and they might inform the design of analytics back down at this level because we are testing models and assumptions from one university, perhaps testing them across many departments or many institutions and then improving the power of the modeling down here again. That all depends on how specific your context is. Right? Okay, so there's a sort of high level view. I was having a quick look at the Insight Center website yesterday and thinking, hmm, what's going on? And uh, what kind of intersection might there be with learning analytics? So you have this figure up here at the moment. And you talk about linked data, recommender systems, media analytics, decision analytics, reasoning, personal sensing. And I'd suggest that actually there are communities, active communities, using these technologies, but in an explicitly educational context already. Here's a few examples, you know, recommender systems in technology enhanced learning, linked data for learning analytics, quantified self, one of the interesting new things coming out, obviously, huge explosion in data from personal devices, um, educational data mining, personalized user modeling and adaptation. These are all fields that are trying to take those technologies already. So there's, you know, there's potential here for the kind of work that you'll be doing to intersect very well with learning analytics. So I've, I've, I've shown you about predictive models, which is very exciting. People are, are getting hugely energized by the idea that we could predict failure and do something about it before the fish are all dead. 
right? But there are many other kinds of analytics as well. So this is just to give you a heads up. So here's a screenshot from Blackboard. Uh, and this is showing really quite boring stuff. And this is what you will get at the moment when you buy an analytics product along with your virtual learning environment. Okay, You can't read this. Logins, interactions online, how long you're online, are you submitting on time, right? That's not hard stuff to measure. And of course, we start by measuring the stuff that's easy to measure. The danger is we only measure the stuff that's easy to measure rather than valuing, asking what's really important for learning and then figuring out whether you could actually measure that, right? And Blackboard say, motivate your students with comparisons. Because the students, the blue, and the, the rest are in the orange. What if it was the other way around? Would you like to get that dashboard showing how miserably you are doing at the moment compared to the rest of the cohort? That might depend on your dispositions. We'll come back to that later. Right? Do you like to be challenged and shown how, what your gap is? Or is that just going to crush you? So we start to introduce ethics at this point. You know, visualizations have ethical affordances. And what a student might make of this, showing how pathetic they are compared to everybody else, that might not be very encouraging. Here's an experimental product from Eric Duval at Leuven. Again, an experimental way of visualizing how intensively are students interacting online. Um, the steeper the curve, the more they're doing in a shorter period of time. So some students are very slow and then pick up. This student was very intensive and then kind of relaxed. Right? And then they share with these color dots roughly where the student is in relation to the sort of median and the average. Okay. Khan Academy. Who's heard of Khan Academy? What did Khan Academy do? Online video tutorials. Online video tutorials. That's what they're famous for. That's not what they're doing now. Or rather, they are. What they're doing now is building massive, very fine-grained analytics that tell you not just you watch this video, but on problem 12, so there's lots of built-in assessment, you know, uh, you, you looked at the following other videos, how long you looked for them. They know every time you rewind and replay, right? Very fine-grained analytics. If 75% of students pause the video at a certain point and rewound it, that looks interesting. What's going on there, right? So when you go to Khan Academy now, it's not just videos with you know, Sal Khan being his usual brilliant self explaining complicated things in an intuitive way. They're building a really, really sophisticated analytics platform. Here's another one, Grokit, preparing students for standardized tests in the States. Fine grain feedback, you know, red, amber, green, on, you know, in this case, it's verbal skills. You know, your use of contrast, continuation, two blank sentence completion, analogies, antonyms, whatever the variables are you need to master, right? So fine-grained adaptive presentation to help you master core skills. Carnegie Mellon have done a huge amount of work on intelligent tutoring. And being academics, they have shown, for example, that if you want to master statistics, if you use their adaptive personalized platform, combined with a blended face-to-face -face seminar with your tutor, you learn the same amount in half the time. You learn a term's work in half a term, and you score higher than traditional. Okay? So this is the kind of evidence base that's starting to build. Right? These guys are doing a better job than a human being at teaching certain kinds of core skills, because it's personalized. It's mass personalization. That's part of the whole big data analytics story. Supposing you have got students working with a whole bunch of different software tools. How would you know if they're using them in the right way at the right time? Any ideas? You can't stand behind all your students and watch them. You know, it's an engineering course, say. You've given them software tools, collaboration tools, design tools, problem analysis tools, a simulation environment. How would you know what they were doing with those tools? And how would you perhaps intervene? Well, Abelardo Pardo, uh, now, it's, uh, now it's Sydney, was at Madrid. Very simple. We'll give you a virtual machine on your desktop. When you do your project work, 
you jump into your virtual machine, which is instrumented to log everything you're doing, which apps you're using, every keystroke. When you're not doing work, just step outside and use all the usual apps on your PC. But when you're doing work, you use the web browser here and the whole, you know, the whole virtual machine. Um, and then that, of course, is streaming data into the central hub so that the, the tutor can then aggregate the, the, the data and see what's going on. A very different shift, okay? I'm just, giving, I'm just throwing examples at you so you can see the breadth of stuff that's going on in analytics work, okay? So I've done some work with my colleague, Rebecca Ferguson, trying to say, look, we've, the social web is you know, a little bit important here. Universities are getting to grips with what the social web has to offer for learning. Um, and you know, we've identified some of the trends that, that we see going on and said, well, what would social learning analytics look like if we took seriously social networking, user-generated content, um, the, the formation of social networks, et cetera? And, and so if that's of interest to you, then Google social learning analytics. And there's a, a webinar online from KMI about that. I'll talk about some of the aspects of that later on. Well, here's an example now. OK, two threaded discussion forums. You can't glance at that and really tell what's going on. Perhaps other than sh see that you know one thread perhaps has lots of comments or something. If you drop in Snap, which is this plugin for the browser, it will parse the dis the, the structure of of, dis of discussions in quite a few different online forums and generate the social network. In this case, the tutor is the sole bottleneck. You know, all the students are only talking to the tutor not good. Here, the tutor is interacting with all the students, but the students are also talking to each other. So we start to make visible, invisible structures. Now, you know all about social networking, so this is simply to explain that this has applications in the world of learning. Right? This, these two students are playing with particular roles connecting these two networks. The tutor here is in the center, but not talking to the students out on the edge. Right? So social network analysis has relevance in learning. There's evidence growing now that the more densely connected a student is in their online interactions, that can correlate with their final outcomes. But if you, you might be in a course which particularly cares about students' ability to forge appropriate peer-to-peer -peer network relationships, that's a core skill that you need in the future. So this might actually be something of great interest. And it's starting to find its way into products. Here's a screenshot from when, it, when, when I was given this. It was a beta version of the desire to learn analytics dashboard. So our work on social learning analytics is starting to penetrate the product space. Here we have a social network graph. They've also red, amber, greened it based on predictive model that's running in the background. And you can see that um, Kate Johnson here probably shouldn't be smiling quite as much. This is work with Cohere. Uh, this is our collaborative knowledge mapping tool at the OU. Um, people, it's, it's based on the knowledge building foundations that Skardamalia and Baraita and other people have developed for knowledge, where you don't just contribute to a forum, but you make a claim and you connect it meaningfully to somebody else's contribution. Uh, it's a form of argument mapping. So we, we can, you know, rather than view the concept network, we can also look at the social network behind that and we can see who's agreeing with who or who's disagreeing with who, because we've got semantics on the links as well. So you, know, you don't normally get to see the nature of the ties between people. So that's interesting. Here's your standard spaghetti social network visualization. Not much use to anybody. This is a network of learners in one of our social learning platforms at the OU. But we can also filter it based on what people are talking about, because we extracted the tags from the content. So when somebody formed a tie to somebody else, we looked at the tags around that content. So we can immediately filter that down and just see who's talking to who around a particular topic. And we can also filter friend, follow, and respond, and other network types. Right? So if we change some of those boxes, we might see a different network for responding to each other versus the network for friending. Again, it's just a, an interesting new way of trying to look at learning networks using social network analytic techniques. 
Okay, let me talk a bit about discourse analysis now. Okay, now one of the most common ways that students interact with each other is, of course, in text. Typing comments, having discussions, and so forth. And for an educator, sometimes you want to know not just who's contributing often to a forum, you know, that's very basic analytics. You want to know well, what's the nature of the contribution? Is it a good contribution? What does a good contribution mean? All right? So this is where language technologies come in. Something that some of you know about. <clears throat> so we're trying to use language technologies to get beyond the trivial and look at something deeper that's up till now invisible to, um, to, stud to students and, and educators, except just you know, manually reading lots and lots of stuff online. So here are a few examples. Here's a webinar. It's a two and a half hour session. There's text chat going on. This is in Blackboard Collaborate. Where are the interesting learning conversations going on? I don't want to have to scroll through the whole thing or watch the two and a half hours necessarily. Maybe I'm a student who came in and was viewing the replay. Maybe I'm an educator trying to keep an eye on what was going on. How would we spot where there seem to be productive exchanges going on here? <coughs> so um, at the Learning Analytics Conference um, this year, we presented a work where we had trained a machine on an annotated corpus to recognize productive exchanges. So we, we were using um, a framework developed at the OU, which contrasts disputational talk, where people simply say, I'm right, you're wrong. OK, not very helpful. Cumulative talk, where you build on someone else's ideas and are more supportive and encouraging and affirm what they've said and perhaps add something of your own. That's good. And then there's something called exploratory talk, where you start to challenge, question, offer your ideas, but for discussion and debate, not just asserting that you've got the answer. Right? So exploratory talk is the sort of ideal form of academic scholarly talk that we often try and we, you know, we love to see that when it's going on well. Right? This is a visualization of two and a half hours session. The length of the bar is the confidence of the machine classifier that it's, that it's spotted either non-exploratory talk or high exploratory talk. Okay? So at the beginnings and the ends, for example, people are just saying hello and goodbye. There's nothing very deep going on. You'd be a bit surprised if the classifier thought that there was profound learning conversations going on within the first 10 minutes of the session. You know, people are just rolling up. But then if we zoom in on a segment here, here we get to see the actual text chat with the classifications down here. And the machine is learning that when people use expressions like, I wonder if, or this is, uh, I take your point, right? Uh, I'm just wondering, I was looking for da 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 da. I'd also like to point out, so da 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 da, not just in, so people are engaging with ideas, they're taking on board someone else's contribution, they're offering an idea for consideration, okay? <coughs> and, um, you know, we find this quite encouraging, and this is, this is using a machine learning technique with, with colleagues, um, Yulan He and uh, Zhong Yu Wai and Rebecca Ferguson my, at the OU. And so here's a different plot, you know, how many of your contributions were rated as exploratory, all right? And then you might draw a line. This is a line we've just drawn to set a threshold. What if every five in six contributions was, was classified exploratory? That's pretty high. Did anybody cut, go above the line? Yes, one person did. And one person here made about 15 contributions, none of which were classified as exploratory. And you could, of course, you know, click on that and go and see what's this guy doing. Right. But what if that guy, his job is mainly to be a sort of facilitator and help students fit in and learn how to engage. Right? Um, that's a role he's been asked to play and he's doing it jolly well. Right? So we, we have to take visualizations with care. We have to look beneath the apparently crisp looking numbers and graphs and ask what does this mean? And I've got you know, quite a few other examples I haven't got time to show you here, where the graphs and charts seem to be telling one story and actually something quite different is going on. So it's just a heads up. You know. Visualizations are cool and sexy, but you know, we're talking about real people doing quite complicated things here. 
Here's another example. Working with Xerox Research Center in Grenoble, um, they have a, a parser called ZIP, the Xerox Incremental Parser. One aspect of that is a rhetorical parser. Um, and <coughs> this can identify in a written text some of the key kind of rhetorical moves that are made when people are making a scholarly contribution. Right? This, is what, this is what you learn to do to get your papers accepted. Right? You will never get your paper accepted if you don't learn how, within a particular community of discourse, semantic web, social you know, web science, whatever your community is, how do you make the right moves in a paper? Right? You do it by saying, we've got a problem. We've got open questions of some sort. We do it by saying, ah, we have an interesting finding to report here. You might do it by contrasting ideas. Right? Bloggs claims this, but Smith have found that. And I'm going to step in and try and resolve that problem. Right? These are the things you learn to do um, as undergraduates, bit by bit, as your essays get better, and certainly as, as PhD students and as research fellows. If you can't learn to do this, you're not demonstrating that you're part of the discourse community. Right? Can a machine do this? Yes, it can. Um, not perfectly, of course. But we, p we work off meta-discourse signals. So these are apparently non-substantive contributions in the paper, right? But it tells the reader how you should take what I'm about to claim. The purpose of this article is, right? It's a high-level statement that orients the reader, right? The perspective I shall use in this essay relies heavily on da 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 da. This paper explores, okay? These are called meta-discourse, and they allow you to understand what kind of claim is being made here, right? So what, what the zip parser does is it picks up on something like the purpose. It's looking for a discourse function. The purpose of this, it's a self-reference article, is to do, 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 do. So something to be classified as a summary statement about what the article's about will have these three elements in some order. We don't care what order it is, but if they're present, there's a high probability that they're summarizing something about the paper, right? And so there's a, there's, they've defined patterns like that, and we've started to do some interesting evaluation work. Here's a Word document. It's about a 100-page project report. We asked the human analysts to go through and highlight what they thought were the key contributions of the report. Right? What's interesting about this report? Right? And they've highlighted stuff and made notes in the margin. Then we feed the report to Zip. Now, in this quite striking example, you can see the machine has decided the same sentences, more or less, were the significant ones. Right? A 100-page report, 90 minutes, two hours work, about two seconds. Right? If technology can start to pick up on interesting scholarly phenomena of that sort and do it sufficiently accurately, that could change the game. Right? It could really change the way we think about um, reading, writing, sense-making. Okay, Not all examples were like this, of course. And humans still do some really special stuff, like reading between the lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're saying that. That's just basically rubbish. You know, what they re you know, I happen to know that. Da, 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 da. Or they're just fudging the issue here. Right? If they'd really found a result, they would have said this. Instead, they just used a kind of woolly expression. Right? Or I see something really significant here because this connects with something I was reading last week. Right? Machine's never going to do that. You know, I am a unique reader making unique sense of a report. I will see connections that no one else will. That's really important. But a machine will, over and over again, relentlessly, without getting bored or tired, do the same thing. Right? And the question then is, well, what's the gap, as with any automated markup technology? Okay. Zip outputs XML, marked up stuff. Right? We think this is emphasis. We think this is contrast. A drawback of the proposed model for representing the drawback sounds like a limitation of some sort. Right. When you've got you know, hundreds or thousands of these text files, you need ways of trying to make sense of it. So one of my students, uh, Doigu Shimshek, 
is developing ways of trying to visualize what's going on. This is work we'd already done where we are doing just simply highlighting the text, you know, using the Cohere Firefox sidebar. Um, but Doigu is developing visualizations that show, for example, when you feed it the proceedings of a conference series, what topics are emerging. And when you click on one of them, to what extent are people talking about information visualization in the context of just citing a background reference or talking about it as background? When they're contrasting it in red there, when they're just some making a summary statement, right? So we're looking at mentions of information visualization, but now we're getting some clues about the ways in which people are talking about it. OK. Now, one of the interesting challenges for learning in the 21st century is coping with huge amounts of ambiguity and complexity. Right? It's about the only thing we know for sure about the future. It's just going to get messier and more complex. Um, and people are going to have to be better at organizing themselves. Um, and people in the world of learning talk about this in a number of different ways. They talk about intrinsically motivated students who have got you know, that inner drive to get up and go. You know, you're only here doing PhDs and, and research because you've got that inside you, right? Most of your colleagues didn't do PhDs, right? But this is what we need in all students increasingly, not ones who simply take what they're given, you know, revise like crazy and pass the test, right? Employers are complaining that people, graduates, do not have the skills needed to walk into a workplace and cope with ambiguity and uncertainty, to think critically, to ask good questions, possibly more important than having the right answer, et cetera. So those are some really important qualities, both for learning, lifelong learning, as well as employment. What does analytics look like for those kinds of things? John Dewey, some of you will have heard of him. If you work in education, you know, 19, early, early, early 20th century. Why do dispositions matter? This is Dispositions is this important concept. Well, you may know knowledge of methods alone will not suffice. There must be the desire, the will, to employ them. This desire is an affair of personal disposition. Are you ready to engage in a situation? Uh, do you welcome a challenge when it presents itself, or do you retreat? Carol Dweck at Stanford has, talks about mindsets. In the growth mindset, people believe that their talents and abilities can be developed through passion and education and persistence. It's about a commitment to taking informed risks and surrounding yourself with people who will challenge you to grow. Not all people are like this. Some people are very defensive. They don't like to be found out that they don't know the right answer. They will retreat from challenging situations. And this is not just children, but adults as well. I work in schools as well as with adults, right? You may know people who are incredibly defensive and don't like to be challenged. Right? Sometimes those people get to quite high positions in universities. Right? You, can, you can get quite senior and simply make sure you always know the right answer and hope that nobody's going to actually expose you. Right? And Carol Dweck has shown that when you teach children that they can get better at learning, they actually do much better than when you simply praise them and tell them how smart they are all the time. Right? So she, you know, it's very, very interesting work. John Seeley Brown former director of research at Xerox PARC, um, now one of the leading thinkers um, in, well, the future of work as well as the future of learning. We're looking at the profiles of what it means to be effective in the 21st century. Resilience will be the defining concept. Resilience means when a shock hits a system, can it recover? That might be a transport system, a food system. It might also be an individual learner. Right? Are you resilient? Do you bend? and then recover, or do you just snap and go to pieces? When challenged and bent, right? Dispositions are now at least as important as knowledge and skills. They can't be taught, they can only be cultivated through practice, through engaging in challenging situations. <clears throat> well, how on earth would we quantify that, right? It's all about quantification. If you can't quantify, you've got no analytics. If you've got no behavior, you've got no data. How do you quantify this kind of stuff? Well, it's quite complicated. You can't just give people a multiple choice test, really. Um, but work at Bristol University with my colleague, Ruth Deacon-Crick. She's you know, a, 
a decade-long program of research which has identified, for example, seven different dimensions of dispositions. Um, and there isn't time to explain them all, uh, but these slides will be available afterwards and there are plenty of background references, right? Critical curiosity. These effective learners like to delve deeper and find out what's going on. They like to get at the truth. They ask questions. Why, what, when, where, how. They're less likely to accept information uncritically. They're going to push back. Right? Creative people, it's not just about being a genius creative person. It's about being playful with ideas. Can you hold an idea lightly? Uh, do you like using your imagination? Um, meaning making. To what extent can you see the connection between what you're looking at now and what you've been seeing in other contexts, right? Learning relationships. Do you know when to work alone effectively and how to use a peer network when you need that peer network? Okay. These people call these 21st century skills. That's another buzzword. Okay. So that's the work that they've been doing in that school of education. I'm coming in and saying, how would you embed that stuff in software platform? How would you scale this up? Um, and we ran a workshop at Stanford recently around dispositional learning analytics, and you can, you can replay that if this is of interest to you. <clears throat> so Bristol have developed a web questionnaire, which is like a self-diagnostic tool, and it generates this sort of gestalt visualization for you that shows to what extent do you see yourself a little quite like me or very much like me on these different dimensions. Right? And this can be quite transformational for somebody, adults as well, senior leaders as well as school children. Right? It can really give you a, a, a way of thinking about learning and how you are as a learner that you never had before. And if you, if you then make some conscientious effort to work on, for example, your critical curiosity, when you do the survey later on, you might show that you'd stretched out on it. But it's complicated, because once you've been given a language for thinking about your learning, you become more aware of it, and you might actually become more self-critical. This is a self-report tool, so that has limitations, right? Um, I might be quite deluded about how good I am working with other people. Perhaps we know a few people like that, right? So the way I answer these questions is it's really about giving me a language to think about myself and to make me more intrinsically driven, taking more responsibility for my learning rather than just hoping that the teacher is going to get me through my test or the department has a duty to get me through my exam. You know, no. Increasingly, you've got to take responsibility for what you're learning because no one else is going to. Then, of course, you can generate cohort data and show a teacher, did you know you've got a class who really don't see themselves as very creative? You've got a class who see themselves as you know, somewhat resilient. Okay? And you might change your strategy accordingly, the way you engage with those people or with that team. In a, in a workplace. One tool we built is Inquiry Blogger. We built a set of WordPress plugins so that we could turn a blog into a learning journal. This is one from a primary school. This is a 12-year-old engaged in their own personal inquiry project and blogging each day how it's going. Right? So they might say, I've had an absolutely horrible day. You know, it didn't go at all well, um, but I stuck with it. You know, whereas Six months ago, I think I would have just given up or gone to ask the teacher. Right? And they would click on the tortoise, who is the resilience animal, right? or kick on the kitten for critical curiosity, or the chameleon, which reflects how I think about myself and the way that I'm changing and learning as a, as a learner. Right? And we find these animals are a very powerful way for certainly younger students to inhabit these characters. In a different context, you might use the Simpsons. In other work in Australia with indigenous young people, they're using animals and birds from their local culture. Right? The eagle who is soaring above, who has strategic awareness. You know? um, so these, these animals are a very powerful way for certainly young people to get inside what it means to be resilient or curious. But here's a master's level student as well, also engaged in a project, and you can see, you know, you can see just a gestalt view of the extent to which they're pushing on these things. Now, of course, this one's all green. And just because I, ch I click a checkbox in my blog as I, as I write doesn't mean I'm right. It's just giving me a way of monitoring that and giving the educator a dashboard 
so that you know if somebody hasn't even started doing anything you might click on there and go straight to their blog if you're very interested to see that Fred is reflecting about his critical curiosity because he's generally rather passive you click on that and go to all his blog entries where he said he thought he was being curious right. and then the interesting question is well that's all self-report whether you know writing a blog or doing a survey could an analytics platform generate something like that just from the data exhaust that I leave behind me right so you might say well look we talked about social network patterns earlier didn't we it might be that different social network patterns in different contexts are a form of evidence about my learning relationships or that if I'm questioning a lot and challenging people in the discussion forum might that be evidence of critical curiosity compared to somebody who doesn't do any of that or meaning making this making connections between ideas in interesting ways well if I retweeted something you had done or tagged a photo you had shared or passed something from one community to another community because I thought they might find it interesting that suggests I'm making interesting meaningful connections that other people perhaps aren't right what if I put completely different tags on a photo than the rest of the class well there's something going on in my head there right I'm seeing something that other people aren't seeing so we might be able to use social media data and connect it into a learning to learn framework of this sort again resilience you know gaming you know is attracting a huge amount of attention for learning and people are extremely resilient in games they will just keep going and try and get to the next level all the time they might be useless in the classroom but they're hugely resilient in a gaming environment and then that, that begs the question well what's going on there how disengaged are they in the classroom what's going on there okay and so we might imagine in the future a kind of social learning analytics dashboard that pulls together some of these ideas um, and gives me a mirror about how my learning is going to complement all the usual stuff about my grades and whether I'm submitting on time and, and so forth. Okay, so just to close then, that's all jolly exciting. Lots of people are getting very energized about it. Funders are starting to put money into this. But there are lots of very interesting issues around the use of this kind of thing. So a quote from some economists. Accounting tools do not simply aid the measurement of economic activity. They shape the reality they measure, right? Especially when those accounting tools come with carrots and sticks about good behavior, right? We might say the same for exams. They are distorting what goes on in schools and universities, according to many people, right? Too much focus on just trying to get that A grade. You know, it doesn't matter what it takes. It really begs the question about what are we measuring and are we, is that the most effective way of measuring it? Ontology building is a way of shaping reality, right? If an ontology-based tool starts to be embedded in a workplace, it's shaping reality. It's using a set of categories that somebody has decided are important. Hopefully they make good decisions, right? So that's why we've sort of said, you know, that a marker of the health of the whole field is not only a focus on what you can make visible, but what you are leaving invisible as well. And there's a fantastic book called Sorting Things Out, if you're interested in this kind of thing, by Bowker and Starr, which is about the way that classification schemes and standards systematically erase memory. Because after a while, you know, only paying attention to the categories that made it into the final standard. Um, Gardner Campbell at Virginia Tech has sounded alerts, you know, he's, he, a warning, we don't want to just measure the easy stuff. The basic question is what does a good education look like? Not just measuring the easy stuff. He worries about data narrowness, instrumental learning, students with no curiosity. Well, what I hope I've shown you is that analytics don't have to be a sort of dumbing down, creating passive students who just want to be told, am I on amber or green? Uh, they can actually create intrinsically motivated students who are starting to take responsibility for their learning. But it's really important that things like Campbell, that kind of argument is being made. I've declared that our analytics are our pedagogy, right? And epistemology, we would add after that. And we, we just published a paper about that. 
Analytics embody a world view. What's important to measure? How are we going to track it? Um, and assessment regimes are what um, strangle innovation often, right? The exam boards, the whole apparatus that, is, that allows somebody to certify somebody are the slowest moving animals on the planet, right? It's very hard to innovate if you can't certify and give somebody evidence they can take to an employer or get their next promotion or whatever it is. But as I said at the beginning, the certification accreditation stranglehold is starting to get broken. Things like open badge movement, etc. Right? So learning analytics are not neutral. People will say, you know, let the data speak for itself. Right? No, data does not speak for itself. This is the analytics cycle. You do a version of this anytime you're collecting data and trying to make sense of it. Right? Here's a much, here's a much richer version. There's not, I won't go through it in detail, but you know, you're going to do data acquisition, store it, clean it, clean. Who's making decisions about what's clean? Integrate it, analyze it, visualize it, do something about it. Right. So when we, when I'm working with you know, uh, a team of students, for example, what kinds of learners are you going to focus on? What kinds of learning? What data are you going to be able to gather digitally? How are you going to render those? Who are you going to render it to? Will they understand what they're seeing? What analytical tools are you going to use? Do you have a theory of learning which would look, drive you to look for certain kinds of patterns? Or are you just going to hope it jumps out at you in some bottom-up way? What human or software intervention are you going to make off the back of that? And ethics are all around this. Because every decision here is infused with values and human judgment. Right? So these visualizations that spring to life on the dashboard are not speaking for themselves. Right? That analytics aquarium dashboard is not speaking for itself. There's just a huge body of established knowledge driving it. And if they made the wrong assumptions, your fish will die. Luckily, it's a pretty robust, mature discipline. So this is the bottom line. Who gets to hold the magnifying glass? There's a real power issue going on here. All right. And could analytics provide mirrors for learners to become more reflective and less dependent, rather than just passive recipients of sort of biofeedback data? Hopefully, these analytics will motivate them and energize them. OK. So if you want to know more about this kind of thing, there is SOLA, the professional society. We have an annual conference. Next one's coming up in Indianapolis in March next year. Replays of all conferences are online already. We had a learning analytics summer school at Stanford uh, in July, as well as a network of events all over the world, which brought together people. There are replays of all the sessions from Stanford online. Coming up this month, uh, we're running uh, a two-week open course where universities will talk about what they're doing on the front line. So I've talked quite a lot about research stuff here. Uh, universities are, of course, busy trying to implement the infrastructure in their own organizations. And um, uh, I'll be sharing some of what we're doing at the OU, as, long as, uh, as well as other institutions and companies coming in. JISC in the UK have published a very helpful set of briefings for higher educational institutions to get up to speed with this. Um, Educores in the States, a huge library around analytics, lots of interesting case studies. Uh, a, a briefing for UNESCO on this, which just really summarizes some of the stuff I've been talking about today. Um, and um, I uh, sort of co-founded a network called Learning Emergence, which is really where we're focusing a lot on dispositional analytics. And there was a workshop at Stanford we ran there, which is replayable as well. So I'll leave you with that thought. We all love a good big brother. <coughs> if you've been lucky enough to have one, you know that they're good. Of course, Big Brother could have capital Bs, and that's the danger. So in 2016, will a responsible school or university use every form of data possible to maximize student success? And how does that come into tension with the kind of ethical issues around surveillance and reading the wrong stuff into data? I'll stop there. Thanks very much. <coughs>